So delirium, the prevalence of delirium ranges depending on which type of patient or which type of ICU you're looking at. So there was a study that looked, a uh, group that looked at 42 studies uh, that contained over 16,000 patients and the occurrence of delirium was about 32%. But if you look at specific patient populations, so such as post-op uh, surgical patients, the rates can be as low as 9% all the way up to 91% in uh, mechanically ventilated cancer patients. So that kind of depends on whether or not, uh, which instrument is used to screen for delirium. So there's different instruments for screening. Um, the patient case mix, how critically ill they are or not if they're post-op patients versus medically intensive care unit patients. Um, and often when you look at research studies, how frequently they screen because delirium fluctuates by nature. And so if you only screen one time, once a day, you may miss occurrences of delirium that occur later in the day. So again, it really depends and there's a wide range, but as low as 9% in post-op surgical patients all the way up to 91% in uh, really sick, mechanically ventilated medical ICU patients. So there's really no good treatment paradigm for patients uh, with delirium. There's actually two um, subtypes of delirium that we think about. Hypoactive, where patients um, are, have quiet symptoms, they'll be lying in the bed, they're not moving very much or causing, uh, th doing things that get attention of the staff. And hyperactive delirium, and those are patients who are moving around a lot, they may be pulling at their tubes and lines, and those are the ones we worry about because they can be a danger to themselves if they pull something out or to others. And so um, we, when we think about treating delirium or what we're gonna do, we kind of tend to focus on the hyperactive patients. Unfortunately, there aren't good studies that look at just hyperactive patients for delirium management, and so we try to focus on non-pharmacologic interventions for delirium. And so we like to try to think about prevention. Unfortunately, in critical illness, oftentimes patients present to the ICU, they already have delirium. Um, but when possible, if they don't present with delirium, we really want to think about ways to prevent it and doing um, things that can actually help prevent delirium um, is one key thing to think about. So the initial um, Society for Critical Care Medicine guidelines came out in uh, 2013 and just now in 2018 a revised or updated um, PADIS guideline came out um, looking at this. And so really the recommendation for delirium is there's no recommendation for a medication treatment for delirium um, based on the available literature. What they do suggest though is um, considering dexmedetomidine in patients who have agitated delirium who are having difficulty weaning from the mechanical ventilator because they're agitated. So there's some data to support that um, use. Um, otherwise, the recommendations are for uh, non-pharmacologic um, interventions, things like uh, patient reorientation, providing hearing and vision uh, adaptations, um, things like uh, early mobility. It's early mobility is one of the things that has been demonstrated to reduce delirium rates, so um, if you can get your critically ill patients up and moving, um, that has a potential to um, impact delirium. So there was actually a large study that just got published um, at the end of 2018, and it was a randomized controlled trial that looked at um, haloperidol versus zeprazidone versus placebo um, in uh, critically ill patients who developed delirium. And that was a negative study, meaning that there was no benefit to the medication versus the placebo in um, reducing days of delirium. Um, they actually also looked at 90-day mortality, and there was no difference in 90-day mortality in patients who got um, active treatment versus placebo. So currently, there aren't um, really any good pharmacologic um, medications that have been uh, demonstrate it to either uh, to reduce delirium duration, prevent delirium in most, uh, most of our medical and critically ill patients. So there are several unmet needs. One of the unmet needs is what the patients and families experience. And so I think we need to do more work and research in what is this experience like for them and how can we support patients and families 
um, when they are experiencing this in the intensive care unit. Um, if you talk to patients and families during the event or post critical illness, they report stories of feeling so out of control and agitated and upset and it's hard for family members to witness um, their, their loved ones during an episode of delirium. So that is one um, thing that needs to be worked on. The other thing I think is educating. Even though we know how to screen for delirium and we know its impact on outcomes, um, many uh, uh, intensive care units around the country and around the world still do not screen or address it and I think that's due to education. So we need to focus on education of staff um, and families and patients. And then the uh, last one is really trying to understand. Delirium is a syndrome, so it presents with these typical um, features and characteristics, but we not, not the, the path of physiology for everybody is different. And so trying to sort out more of the individual pathophysiologies for each subgroup of patients to try to target therapies based on what the mechanism for the delirium may be.